So what are we talking about here? So what we're talking about, and Dietmar began to talk about this, we're talking about the fact that there was a very strong paradigm around the idea that the producer was the innovator. And ever since Schumpeter in 1934 or so, this was, was thought to be the case. And you've all heard about the linear model of innovation, right? Where, you know, first you get some needs, and then you develop, and then you market the fuse, and it's all a producer thing. Because of the idea that producers were the innovator, nobody ever looked to see if users were innovating. Why would you look if there was nothing to see? So we managed to persuade, the, first the British, that you know this was worth doing, and so they, uh, they came up with uh, uh, 100,000 pounds or something, and we began to do a national representative survey of actual consumers. Nobody ever looked before. Nobody ever thought consumers consume, right? Nobody ever thought they innovated. What did we find? 6.1% of the population has developed or improved the product for their own use. That is 2.9 million people. That is more money being spent, in that case, given the size, these last numbers are calibrated to the size of the consumer product industry in that field, in that country, so in the UK, it's 140%. In other words, the users are spending more money to develop products for themselves than the companies are spending to develop money products for them. And yet it's totally unmeasured. And it is given away for free. They don't apply for patents. So what happens here? Well, what happens here is that the system is designed around the idea of supporting producers to innovate. And in fact, what's going on is that there's this dark matter that says larger, larger of users actually pioneering at the front end. So we have to, so I'll talk to you about some policies in a minute, we have to talk about how to change the innovation policy environment and so on to better coexist with reality in this field. Now, there's a very strong community over here, just to tie this back to UHH, where all of us are working together to do this. Like, Cornelius Herstock was one of the first people, uh, you know, to come over. He was doing his dissertation. And he came over and said, you know, Eric, uh, you only have one case study, Von Hippel. You know, you really need some more research in this area. I said, oh, okay, and he said, well, you know, I'm doing this, and so we did it together. We did it, I mean, I, you had done the research, really, and I helped out a bit, and, and uh, that became uh, one of the early papers in this field. And then Christian Luzja, uh, it's so funny, uh, we wrote a paper along with Cornelius. Uh, this shows the power of the paradigm, the producer paradigm. We wrote a paper showing that 30%, or maybe it was 22%, 22% of mountain bikers who are serious about it modify or build their own bikes with innovations. We thought, that's fine, that's empirical, that's a good thing, that's a... So we sent it off to an article and to a, to a journal, and it was considered still at that time so wrong that we were rejected with just a desk review. He said, consumers do not innovate, they consume. It is wrong of you to think otherwise. <laughs> so we thought we went to an R&D journal, and that's where it went. So, so this has been both fun and a struggle. To show this idea of user innovation was before our representative surveys was so counterintuitive. First we showed it in scientists. And they said, yeah, that's just scientists being scientists. Then we showed it in sporting equipment. Christoph Heiner is here, and he was the one, I don't do any sports, he does. And uh, I did kite surfing, which was quite a dangerous activity, and he survived. But we showed it in, in kite surfing, and they said, yes, you know, that's all those sports people being idiots. You know? But finally, you know, now it's becoming relatively conventional wisdom. And, and so I'm really, you know, again, this is in a close struggle. Now, one of the reasons why producers think that users don't innovate is because what the users create is in fact very much like a prototype. 
So this is an example on the left of a scientific instrument. And I'm sure this kind of thing would be very familiar in your lab, right, where you put something together. Now, what happens is, as I showed you in the case of John Hatcham Gibbon, over seven years or so, users are spreading this kind of innovation. This particular one is an automated radio in the assay system. And eventually, the manufacturer comes up. Now, the manufacturer takes that over there and puts it in there and does the product engineering, which is very helpful. Look, it has a slopey front. It has an operator's manual. I mean, it, it actually works more of the time, I suspect. And there's a maintenance technician. So you can see that there is a difference in the producer supply something. But the interesting thing is that when you ask the manufacturer who innovated, you or the user, they'll say, well, we did. And you'll say, well, what about that? And they say, well, it was a good idea. But it wasn't anything, you know? This is. Also, it happens, you know, in this case, in uh, 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 agricultural equipment, farmers develop their own innovations. This is the first center pivot irrigation system, which is an important innovation in agriculture. Look at that thing. It has all the features, but you can see that it took pieces of things that were around, which is what users do. Those wheels are the wheels off an old agricultural implement. Those pipes are pipes that he had that was used in agricultural irrigation prior to this point. So he put it together, but it's actually quite sophisticated. There's water, it's this, the water is diverted and driven uh, through that piston there to turn the wheels and so on, so it's quite sophisticated. Spread in Iowa. Next step, producer. It's the same thing. It's quite cleaned up, but it's the same thing. Now, I'm a person with terrible social graces. So I called up the firm. And I said, so who invented this thing? You or someone else? And they said, well, we did, my son. And when you send us the plaque, be sure to spell our names right. Well, I said, yeah, but what about this? I told you I had poor social graces. What about this? I said, yeah, what about it? Did you know about that? Yeah, we know about that. I said, well, didn't they invent it? They said, no. I said, why not? And they said, you should have seen the lousy quality of his welding. <laughs> his welding, you should have seen the lousy quality. Ah, anyway, so it is difficult. Interestingly enough, it has been invisible in statistics because nobody asked. But it's also invisible in firms because of the perceptions. We're all proud of what we do. And we sort of look at what we do as the important thing. And very often, that important thing you know, of that the users do is overshadowed. So now, we ended up, and Christina Roche and I put this together. This is now what we're saying is the world according to uh, our group. Basically, you have the producer paradigm there. Producers do innovate. You have a user innovation paradigm, which is also large and is the top arrow, and involves users innovating, freely revealed and collaborative improvement, and then peer-to-peer -peer diffusion. So it goes, it goes out, it diffuses, but it's not by the market. And then you have a transition in the middle where you sort of have some things that the producers decide are worth producing, and that's that arrow there, and then like in the case of John Hasham Gibbon, and it becomes a commercial product. But the top paradigm, the top system, runs complete from innovation to diffusion. Now, it's fascinating once you see this kind of a thing going on. And so Professor Rosh and I worked on this paper and began to think about what is sort of going on with respect to these two paradigms. And one of the things you learn as you think about how they interact is that the producers take some things and commercialize them, but other things that are required to give those things value are not ever produced. They continue to diffuse peer to peer. So in John and Hasham Gibbons case, the manufacturer took over the production of the heart-lung machine. 
but the techniques that were required to give that heart-lung machine any value are only diffused peer-to-peer. -peer. So the manufacturers not only produce just part of what's required, but their existence depends upon this infrastructure that the users build around them to sort of make that thing operation. So now you also see websites for easy diffusion. This is Thingiverse for 3D printers. The sort of the infrastructure is beginning to build up by which things can cheaply diffuse. Companies are doing it too. This is a Lego factory. Uh, again, uh, Christoph has been studying this, where basically, and also Christopher Lettle, who's around here too, sort of the idea is that, uh, you know, if you as a company create a website, and this might be germane to your business in, 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 if you create a website, all the user activity that used to run around, if you create a website that is helpful to the users, they will concentrate their activity through it and you can observe it. So in this case, what they did was they said, oh, you know, you are innovating like crazy out there with Legos, post them here. Post them here. You can sell them on our website. You can even design your own box. <coughs> what happens then? The result is that Lego sees which ones of these things are popular. And Lego has a way then to do marketing research as well as innovation. Because the user uptake, which is now just flowing through the site as a free good, is indication of market benefit. This is just another example of sort of the way that you do these things. So bottom line, what are we talking about? We're talking about the fact that users innovate. We're talking about the fact that it's huge. We're talking about the fact that the institutional structure is not yet put into place, which will make it operate efficiently. But there are experiments out there. A major market failure is in the area of diffusion because users, unlike producers, don't have an incentive to diffuse. But you can do things to actually make that better. Now, what are they doing, in other words? So here's Obama. In the US, this thing is being really pushed. So you see Obama there. He invited these people to the White House, these uh, maker people. And uh, you know he's, he's, he's sort of blessing the movement, creating regulatory white space for user innovators. That's happening at a great speed in the US, and I don't know about here. Measuring user innovation. The first one was done by Nesta. And then uh, Fred Galt says, and I'm going to quote him when I go to 10 Downing Street uh, on Friday, uh, that you can add measure of sophisticated users. You can add sort of to, uh, 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 you, can, you, can, you can increase the amount of innovation that your society is visibly doing by a huge amount simply by starting to add up what users do. And then you fund user innovation projects specifically in Sweden, and you put user innovation into national innovation policy. So these are the kinds of things that are happening now. And uh, I think we're all excited about the next 20 years. I mean, we're all going to have great fun. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs>